everybody. I apologize for uh, the delay. We're having a few technical difficulties, but we're just going to go ahead and get started since we have thousands of people all across the country um, tuning in tonight to watch us. Um, welcome to the Inequality for All Google Hangout. Um, Google Hangout. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mariana Ruiz from MoveOn.org, and I'm going to be moderating tonight's conversation with economist Roger Reich, who's going to be joining us in just a few minutes. Um, and we're going to be talking about his new award-winning film, Inequality for All. And also joining us to talk about the film is Jacob Kornbluth, the director of Inequality for All. And to round out our conversation this evening and talk about organizing for economic justice on the ground, we have Devante Yates and Marielle Crowley from Raise Up Milwaukee. So to kick us off, I am going to just provide a little bit of context for why we're here tonight. Um, so there's a growing economic inequality in the United States. Our middle class is shrinking, and the top 1% are making themselves richer, while the rest of us get poorer. And we're feeling this all across the country. It's absolutely no secret. Um, and an example of this can be found in a report that was released yesterday about how fast food workers earning just under $8 an hour are struggling to provide for their families. And so they're ending up having to rely on public aid programs. And what happens is that we, the taxpayers, are essentially subsidizing big corporations like McDonald's, enabling them to exploit workers as they turn around and sack away more and more money. So on tonight's uh, hangout and conversation, we're going to dig more into the causes of income inequality. And we're going to talk to, and we're going to find out what workers and people all across the U.S. are doing to bring about fairness in our economy. Um, so before we get started, I know that we have lots of folks that are watching all across the country. And if you want to ask questions of the panelists tonight via Twitter, you can do that using hashtags inequalityforall and Reich Hangout. Um, so we're going to get started now. Robert's going to be joining us in just a minute. Um, but I want to welcome Jacob, Devante, and Marielle. Um, and just before we get started, I just want to say congratulations to Jacob and Robert when he joins us um, on your documentary special jury award for achievement in filmmaking from Sundance. That's quite an amazing accomplishment. Thank you. Uh, so I just want to take uh, a couple minutes right now to just hear a few remarks from our panelists. So Jacob, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Uh, well, I should say that um, that uh, maybe I'll start out by just why I made the film. Um, uh, three or four years ago, I had never done anything politically active. I think a lot of people of my real political change happen in work. And it was uh, hard for me to find the motivation to get going, to actually figure out what to, how to engage in the debate. But um, what happened was, after the economy crashed in 2008, 2009, I had had it. And I thought, I'm a filmmaker. I need to pick up a camera and do something about this problem. I think it's the biggest problem of our times, this growing income inequality. And I can tell a story about it as a filmmaker. That's what I can do. So. I did what I could do to do something about the problem, and I think everybody can do something about the problem. Like I said, I had never had any experience making docu a documentary before. I was a filmmaker of fiction films, but I had never made a documentary, but I thought, I need to make a documentary about this now. So that's why I felt so inspired to make, uh, to make this, and now it's expanding this week to over 100 screens. Um, it started out on 25 screens about four weeks ago. It's, expanded to 100, and I think hopefully it's starting the kind of conversation about how to fix the economy that I think our nation really needs. Great, thank you. Um, and then I want to turn it over to Devante and Marielle, if you can tell us a little bit about, um, about why you're organizing and, and yeah, just share with us why you're here. Oh, well, my name is Devontae Yates. Um, I work at McDonald's, and the reason why, you know, we're organizing is because fast food and retail, you know, are one of the fastest moving jobs in the country right now. And with these fast food and retail jobs, you know, making minimum wage here in Milwaukee, it's $7.25. Mm -hmm. And $7.25, you obviously won't be able to 
have a basic living off of that. So for me, you know, to be able to go out and organize and go to different stores and gather workers and, you know, let them know what's going on about the economy and letting them know that, you know, we work hard, we're underpaid and underappreciated, you know, we're the workers that make these companies thrive. Without these companies, without us, these companies wouldn't be able to prosper as much as they do. These CEOs wouldn't be able to take in as much money as they're taking in because we're the ones that's on the front lines for them. They don't go through what we go through on a day-to-day -day basis. So we feel that, you know, you can at least appreciate us more by paying us more because you can very well afford it. You know, as far as, like, the government assistance and all of that, like, we don't want to be on government assistance. We will gladly trade in government assistance for a better pay. Mm -hmm. But because we're making 725 and because we do have bills and we do have families that we need to take care of, we are forced to rely on government assistance in order to get by. Um, food stamps, for example, people need them because they can't afford to eat. It's either, you know, take that $200 check and pay your light bill and not eat for a month, or eat for a month but sit in the dark. And mm -hmm. that's choices that we shouldn't have to make because we work so hard. I'm Mario Crowley. I work at McDonald's as well. And uh, yeah, for the same reasons I'm here, I think Devante feels the same way I do. It's time for a change. I, um, a lot of people feel like we don't know what we're doing or you're like just some kids looking to get more money to just do whatever and spending on clothes and shoes. And it's really not like we're hardworking people. We have bills. Some of us have kids to take care of. You know, we want to go to college and support ourselves. We can't do that making 725 the basic minimum wage. You know, like you're giving us the minimum and telling us that that's all we're worth when we're bringing in billion dollar profits. So we're obviously worth something more if we're working for you and you can take advantage of us. So I'm here because I feel like there, there's time for a change and we deserve more. So we're working to get more. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'd like to hear a little bit about how you started organizing your campaign and if you could just tell us a little bit about about the campaign that you're working on. Well, basically, um, we had a set of organizers that's, that's the uh, MWOC that where we are stationed at, us uh, Milwaukee Workers Organizing Committee. And basically, they came into the shops and they basically, they talked to us and they got our stories and they told us that we could actually stand up and do something for ourselves rather than stay where we are and, and let the companies throw these nickels at our feet, these pennies at our feet. You know, so they gave us our voice and they gave us the tool to voice that opinion. And now it's not only us, it's people all over the country going on strike and just doing what they believe in and standing up and saying that we're worth more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Jacob, I want to I want to turn it back to you for a second, and would like to hear a little bit about the film um, in the context of what of what um, of what workers are doing across the country and organizing. Um, can you can you speak to sure. that a little bit? Well, there's this um, there's this uh, first of all to everybody watching. Uh, uh, Robert Reich will be here soon, and uh, I will do my best to uh, to communicate his views uh, as best. I've heard him a lot, so I'm not bad to uh, to, to to give this a try. But um, so what you've seen over the last 40 years, my life since the mid 70s, is this widening gap between the rich and everybody else. Um, this imbalance in the economy has massive impacts on all kinds of things that affect us uh, every day. You can see, you can literally track the share of middle class wages in the economy. Uh, you can literally track the share of middle class wages in the economy with the share, with, uh, with unions. As unions have declined, so have a share uh, that the middle class has had of, of the, of the uh, economic gains in, in um, in a society. So you can see that on a big picture. Now you've seen a lot of effects uh, that uh, globalization have had on unions in terms of outsourcing jobs, but there are a lot of jobs that are created in America now. The largest growth sector is in this 
uh, retail and fast food uh, uh, jobs, and those jobs can't be outsourced. This is exactly the these are the, this is exactly the type of work that our economy needs right now. It's to organize is to these uh, is to organize jobs like this so that people can get a fair living wage for doing them. So I think in the context of what to do about growing income inequality largely, this is an important part of it, and uh, and I'm glad to be on a panel with them. Awesome. Um, thanks, Jacob. And and I uh, just want to say that Robert Reich has joined us. Robert, can you hear us? Oh, it looks like you're it looks like you're still muted. Um, can others hear him? I can't hear him. Uh. Um, looks like there's a there's a microphone at the top of the screen of your computer that might not be on, or you might want to turn up the sound on your computer as well. Can you hear well, me? Now? Oh, there we go. Okay, good. Welcome, Robert. Well, uh, thank you. I'm sorry I'm a little late. We had some technical problems, but I'm glad to be here. That's okay. We're really glad that you're with us. Um, so we just we're just doing going through and having our first opening remarks. Uh, just like to welcome you um, and um, congratulations on, on your film winning uh, winning the jury prize at Sundance. Um, and so we just want to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about your film and maybe talk a little bit about about why there's such uh, a large income inequality uh, gap right now. Uh, okay, well, um, really, Jake gets all the credit for the film. I mean, it's his film. He was the director. He put it together. Uh, but uh, let me just say that uh, you know, the issue of widening inequality is something that has been a, a scourge uh, on the American economy for many years. It's just now becoming, uh, I think we're coming to a tipping point where we have so much of the economy in the hands of so few people uh, in terms of concentrated income and wealth that uh, the economy can't function. There's just the middle class and everybody who wants to be in the middle class just don't have enough purchasing power to keep the economy going. That's one reason why the recovery is so anemic, uh, so slow, so little, and why unemployment uh, continues to be very high. Uh, and the official unemployment uh, numbers don't even register all of the people who are involuntarily uh, unemployed and who uh, you know, have given up looking for work because they can't even possibly find work. There's still almost three people looking for every job that's available and uh, even the jobs that are being created tend to pay very low wages, uh, lower wages than the jobs we lost. Meanwhile, uh, the people at the top have never had it so good. They are doing wonderfully well. Uh, the, they made up all the ground they lost uh, from the Great Recession uh, and, uh, and then some. Uh, all of the 95 percent of all the economic gains since uh, the recovery began in 2009 uh, have gone to the top 1%. Uh, the median household income has actually dropped about 6 or 7% adjusted for inflation. I mean, the, you know, we're, we're worse off now in terms of inequality than we were uh, even uh, before the Great Recession. Uh, and uh, this is a huge problem. It's a problem for the economy. It's a problem for our democracy. One thing that we know is that with inequality comes a lot of uh, divisiveness, a lot of polarization, uh, and look at what's happened in Washington. I mean, the, yeah. what's happened in Washington is a part and parcel of what our film is about. Um, thank you. Um, I want to I want to open this up a little bit more. When you so when you say that that we're at a tipping point, that that statement right there <coughs> scares me. Um, and so I'm curious when you when you say that, what do you mean by that? Uh, I mean that um, quite apart from issues of fairness and morality, which are huge when you're talking about inequality, but, but let's put those temporarily to one side and just look at the effects on the economy uh, and then look at the effects on democracy. Uh, and anybody who thinks that the economy is healthy uh, or that democracy is healthy right now uh, is not looking very carefully. Uh, our economy is still in very bad shape. It's very, very, very fragile. 
and our democracy is in the hands of a fewer and fewer number of people uh, who are calling the shots and financing and bankrolling uh, most of our candidates. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, this is a product of inequality. So when you say tipping point, when I say tipping point, what I, say, what I simply mean is that um, we're getting very rapidly to the point where our economy and our democracy, neither of them is functioning. Uh, and a large part of that dysfunctional uh, aspect of both the economy and the, uh, our democracy has to do with widening inequality, uh, the decline of the middle class, uh, the increase in poverty, uh, the uh, difficulty uh, people have uh, moving upward in our society uh, and the shrinking number of people at the top who are taking home uh, more and more of the nation's income and wealth. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then I want to I want to pivot over to Jacob for a second. Um, just thinking about the film, um, people. It seems like it seems like people are taking notice of the film. What are you like, what are you seeing? How in what ways do you think that people are taking notice of the film? Well, um, uh, I think uh, first of all, uh, we need as many as possible to actually go to see it. So I should say that you know we're playing on we're playing in a theater near you wherever you are around the country. You can go to inequalityforall.com uh, and. Uh, and on there will be a list of places it's playing, and please go to see it, because um, what we found is that it's an incredibly inspirational film for people. Uh, at our first screening at Sundance, uh, Bob came up with me, and he got a five-minute standing ovation, and then afterwards, people, uh, someone raised their hand and said, I can't believe I just laughed and cried at a film that I thought was going to be about the economy. Um, I'm a little bit embarrassed. Did anybody else have that experience? And we saw these hands sort of sheepishly go up around uh, around the theater. So I think um, it's not, it's a film that I think speaks to, a, I, like I say, to me, the most important issue of our times. But I think it's also, um, I've, I've been hearing that it's sort of an emotional journey. It, it, you can experience it like a film. And for that reason, it has a chance to reach people who don't ordinarily go to see films like this. There's a chance that we can, if we can, uh, get the people who are on this call to bring a friend or somebody who does not normally, you know, get excited about seeing a film about the economy. If we can get you to bring somebody who wouldn't ordinarily go to see this, that would be amazing. And that's what we're kind of after. We have a, a right now a student ticket giveaway. So if you're a student, you can go see the film because often uh, they don't go to see documentaries and they're exactly who should be seeing this film because they're inheriting this problem of widening income inequality that that the film uh, that the film addresses, and I think for a lot of people like you know my wife who's a school teacher and who doesn't usually like economics and politics, she um, she loves this movie, and I think because for the first not just because her husband made it, but because she thinks for the first time that she gets it, that she understands the problem, and I think for a lot of people that's what we've been hearing, mm -hmm. that even if they think they knew they thought they knew something about widening income inequality. Now they understand why it's a real problem. So that's been an amazing experience, and um, and you know it, it all comes from the experience of seeing it in a film with other people, which is pretty transformative and wonderful. At least it has been for me. Thank you. Um, and then I want to go back to Devante and Marielle. Um, so so hearing so hearing some of this, I mean, you guys are you guys are doing a lot to try to to fight against um, income inequality. Organizing is, uh, is really important. Um, can you talk a little bit about what, like, what you guys hope to achieve through your organizing efforts? Um, you know, just get this union form for the fast food and retail workers, you know. That's something that, you know, has never been done or achieved before. Like, when is the last time you've seen the country come together to form something that, in my opinion and in everybody's opinion, positive, because not only will it improve the working field for the fast food and retail workers, it's something that won't just affect us, but future generations to come. And, you know, the, like I said earlier, these jobs aren't bad jobs. You know, the people that work these jobs are good at what they do. You know, otherwise they wouldn't be there as long as they're there. So through our organizing efforts, we just hope to achieve um, a living wage and to just be feed, treated fairly and to be appreciated by these companies. Mm -hmm. And can you say a little bit about um, 
Can you say a little bit about what's happening across the country? Um, because maybe folks that are tuning in right now have no idea about all the organizing and the strike that you guys had earlier this year. So can you talk a little bit about about your campaign and what you guys have been doing to try to, to fight um, the corporation? Well, um, over the course of the last few months, um, we started off our first strike. It was only about what nine, nine states. It was nine states. Um, our second strike, we had about thirty states, and our last strike, we had seventy-two cities, cities that actually went out on strike with us, as we protested and striked and walked off our jobs, just to let these people know, like we're sick and tired of working for these poverty wages, not being treated fairly on the job. You know, not being able to progress like we should be able to progress after being so dependable and so reliable for such a, a long time with these companies and not being able to move forward. And basically, we've just been organizing and growing because that's our main, I mean, that's like the ideal subject just to grow and come together to be able to build a union and then be able to get our voice out and actually show and tell people because a lot of people really don't know the struggles that you know that we have like a lot of people don't know a lot of people don't even understand like we go through things that people wouldn't even imagine on the job so it's like just to be out and get our voices heard and people hear us and see us and we're out there and we're in people's faces and we're letting people know that you just can't survive anymore this and can you say a little bit about how how your organizing efforts have been received by the boss some bosses have been very by the, cooperative. By the, company, by the companies so, that you're organizing uh, mm -hmm. against? Some have been cooperative as far as like the striking laws and everything and not, you know, some are supportive of it, but because of their position, they have to kind of keep quiet about it. And then there are some who do push back and, you know, retaliate against the workers and different things to try to get them to stop doing what they're doing. But in the end, when you have numbers behind you, when you have support behind you, well, strong support, you know, it doesn't matter what the boss does, you're still going to stand up and fight for what you believe in because at the end of the day, nobody can break what you believe in, no matter who it is. And the thing with these strikes are they're not like those week-long, month-long strikes. They're one-day strikes to say, hey, without us, this business won't run. We've had stores that couldn't open because all of their workers didn't show up to work. Mm -hmm. So it was like, hey, you know, without us, this store's not going to run. Who's going to run it? You can't run it by yourself. Yeah. So we do these one-day strikes and return to work the next day to show them, like, you know, yes, we're sick and tired, but yes, these are jobs and we're going to work them and we're going to work them to the best of our ability so that, you know, when it is time to get what we deserve, you won't be able to say, well, oh, they're lazy or they don't work to their best of ability abilities because we do work to the best of our ability, so there shouldn't be any reason why we can't get what we deserve. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, thanks. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit now over to, uh, actually I, we're ta I'm starting to take questions. I'm opening it up questions to folks on Twitter and on YouTube, and a few questions have come in, so I want to um, throw out some of those questions to you all. Um, and so, um, and so uh, this one is for, for Robert, um, and this is from Spencer O'Dowd. Um, how do you feel about, about the idea of fiscal autonomy, um, that is, all the regions of the U.S. paying for only one federal services within their region? How do I feel about um, all of the regions of the United States paying for only one federal service within their region? Yes. That's one of the questions that just came in. Um, I'm, I'm having a little bit of a hard time understanding exactly what that refers to. I mean, right now we have a federal system in which uh, uh, states like California, New York, Massachusetts uh, pay in much more than they're getting back from the federal government, and states like uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Oklahoma uh, get back much more than they're paying in to the federal government in terms of taxpayers. Um, is I don't know if the question is suggesting that uh, states get back only what they pay in 
or I'm not, I'm not sure. Maybe you can translate for me. I'm, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. That was really all that I was given. Um, we can move on to, and there's a few other questions that folks have, um, that folks have asked. Um, here's another one. Ezra Klein has made a cogent argument for a negative income tax instead of minimum wage. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, we, we already have a negative income tax. It's called the Earned Income Tax Credit, uh, and it provides uh, low-wage workers with an average of about two to three thousand dollars a year. Uh, I think it should be expanded, but it's not a it's not a replacement for the minimum wage. Uh, you can't construct an earned income tax credit. That is a reverse income tax that's big enough to be a replacement for the minimum wage for one simple reason. Uh, that uh, if it was big enough to be a replacement for the minimum wage, that would mean that with every increase in your wage, that is every time you went up to another uh, kind of uh, promotion, uh, you would get such a demotion in terms of how much you'd lose from that uh, negative income tax that you'd, you'd have no incentive to, to get a promotion. Uh, we need a minimum wage and we need a reverse income tax together. Together, they both need to be expanded. The minimum wage ought to be uh, raised to, in my view, uh, 14 or 15 dollars an hour. Uh, and then you've got to have, uh, on top of that, a reverse income tax, an earned income tax credit uh, that uh, I would say uh, provides uh, $5,000 to the lowest wage worker. Um. And then this question is for Jacob. Um, Jacob, what can what can ordinary people, average people, do to take action on reducing income inequality? Well, um, it's a good question, and, and I started uh, I started by talking about uh, myself and as an example of somebody who wasn't uh, any kind of in any kind of special position to do something about this but decided it was so important that I had to do something anyway so I would say just start by saying that whoever you are uh, and whatever position you're from start there if you're a teacher do something you know do you can do something if you're if you're a small business owner you can do something if you're a fast food worker you can do something and if you're a filmmaker you can do something too so you can start from where you are and we actually did a lot of thinking about this and putting together a website at uh, inequalityforall.com. So you can actually go there and start from a couple of different starting points to figure out some actions you can take. One of them is by who you are. The other is by your geography, like where do you live? What area are you starting from? So if you live in a given town and there are certain issues you can plug into uh, that matter to you locally, you can start there. And then a third way is by issue. Some people just care passionately about a given issue. For this big issue of widening income inequality is sort of tied together with six sort of uh, pillars of activism, if, if you will. One of them is education. The other is tax reform. The third is uh, Wall Street reform. The fourth is um, uh, campaign finance reform. The fifth is unions. And the sixth is... Uh, the one I always forget. <laughs> but making, it's ma raising the minimum making wage. Work, it's the minimum wage, yes, of course. Making work pay. So it, each one of these pillars are sort of tied together. So if you care about any one of those issues particularly, uh, you can also plug in that way. So and I think I they, are, they, are tied, they are tied together. I mean, uh, minimum wage workers are workers who in fast food restaurants, for example, I mean, you show solidarity. Uh, get involved in an organizing campaign. Uh, help them... Uh, reach more people, uh, help uh, you know uh, Walmart workers uh, again raise their pay. I mean, Walmart is the largest employer in the United States, uh, and yet the the typical Walmart worker uh, is earning eight dollars and eighty cents an hour. If you include part-time workers, and many of them are part-time workers, eight dollars and eighty cents an hour uh, is the Walmart, the largest employer in the United States, a profitable company. You would think that it would have more. Uh, a degree of social responsibility uh, than to pay its workers uh, wages that are so low that the rest of us have to subsidize uh, in the form of uh, all sorts of uh, food stamps and everything else that people need uh, because Walmart is not paying them adequate wages. Same thing with fast food workers, McDonald's and other uh, companies. 
So yeah, so so I think that the, the interesting, it's all these things. It's sort of figuring out the issue that you're plugging into and then sort of understanding how it affects the bigger issue, uh, how these things are interconnected, how they tie together, how the fight for a minimum for a decent living wage at fast food restaurant in Milwaukee is tied to this problem that's going on in the country generally. So support these guys and sort of understand how it ties into this bigger, this, uh, this bigger struggle. So I'm, so I'm curious a little bit. Uh, one of the questions that, uh, that just came in was about, was about history. So trying to understand this in the context of history, um, is this, is this something that's happened before? And if it is, um, what have people done in the past? To fight against it? Uh, it's happened at least two times before in American history. Uh, one is in the late uh, 19th century, the 1880s, uh, 1890s, uh, and what we did as Americans, we came together, we broke up the biggest trusts, the big monopolies, uh, the oil companies, uh, we had, uh, we established a, a progressive income tax uh, that would hit uh, the wealthy with a larger, uh, a larger, higher rate than average uh, people. Uh, we invested substantially in education and in uh, infrastructure. We we made sure that people uh, that equal opportunity was reality. Uh, that was between 1901 and 1916. And then in the 1930s, what did we do? We we uh, required employers to bargain in good faith uh, with employees, uh, supporting the formation of labor unions. Uh, we had uh, social insurance, social security, uh, workers' compensation, minimum wage, 40-hour uh, work week with time and a half for overtime. Uh, all of these things we now take for granted, but they were the products of changing the rules in the 1930s to make sure the economy was working for everybody. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, civil rights uh, and voting rights, uh, we expanded opportunity again, uh, Medicare, uh, we, uh, we, we reduced poverty among the elderly, which was a real scourge uh, by the 1960s. Uh, in the 1990s, I, li I wish we had done more, but I, I'm proud that as a, a member of the Clinton administration, we invested even more in education and job training, a Family and Medical Leave Act. You know, there are a lot of things that can be done, and we have done them before in history. Uh, and the, the optimistic re uh, note, and the thing that I want people to understand, is that this country has got to a similar place before in terms of inequality. And every time we have, citizens start organizing and mobilizing uh, and advocating and getting change. Uh, there's no reason we should be uh, economic determinists and sit on our hands and say, well, nothing can change, or politics is rotten. Uh, no. If you take that attitude, nothing is going to change. Uh, if you take the attitude that we can make substantial changes, we can organize, we can, we can mobilize ourselves, uh, then there is a real prospect to do what we have done before, and that is rescue capitalism from its own excesses. Um, we just got another question in, and this one's for you, Robert. Um, is there a chance for a national union? Well, I, I think there is a, a chance that we can expand unionization, but, but let's be clear what's happened. Uh, you know, in uh, the 1950s, 35 percent, that's more than a third of all workers, uh, belonged to a union. That gave workers a huge amount of bargaining power. That, that was not a national union, but it was an amalgamation of, of unions. The uh, AFL-CIO uh, formed essentially a, a confederation of unions. Uh, but now, in the private sector, fewer than 7 percent of Americans are unionized. Uh, and as Jake was saying before, uh, the decline of the middle class, if you plot as we did in the movie, the decline of the middle class on top of the decline of unionization, it fits perfectly. It is absolutely correlated. Uh, and so unions are a, a big part of the answer. They're not the only part of the answer, uh, but they are a, a major and important part of the answer. Um, and then going back to Devante and Marielle, um, so, so hearing all this, uh, folks have also been tweeting in wondering um, how you guys have been have been so strong being able to stand up uh, for your rights. So some of the questions coming in are about, you know, do you face fear? Are you afraid when you're standing up there going on strike? What's the ex what's your experience been like? 
Well, for me, it you know there are certain situations where you do get fearful, but if you have enough courage and if you have enough strength and if you truly believe and what you're standing up for is right and you know that it's going to benefit you and others in the long run, you put that fear aside and you let your courage overpower all and just do what you got to do. You stand up. There's nothing wrong with voicing your opinion. There's nothing wrong with standing up for what's right. And the only thing that can come from that is awareness and other people are going to look at you and listen because you are taking that step and facing fear and standing up for what you believe in and saying what you have to say, saying what you believe in, speaking out against what's wrong. So there are multiple situations. Going out on strike alone is a fearful situation. Mm -hmm. But when you have people who are going to face that fear with you, when you have supporters who have your back, when you have other workers in your city as well as around the country, you put that fear to the side and you just do what you got to do for you, the people around you, and future generations. Um, and then another another question came in for the two of you about um, about what 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 can folks do to support your efforts? Like people want to know what they can do to support your organizing efforts. Um, well, if you are a low wage worker and you believe in what we believe in, go to lowpayisnotok.org. That is lowpayisnotok.org. And that's basically where our um, our website is. And it has everything from, you know, the basics of what we're doing, events, you know, if you need a little background history as to how the campaign got started, um, we have petitions that you can sign, you know, saying that you do support the living wage and that you do want to stand up and make a change. You know, petitions itself can change something because if you get a knock on your door, and there's thousands of petitions sitting there with people, you know, stating what they believe, stating what they want. You know, thousands of them, you're not going to have a choice but to listen because you know that there's more There's more of us than there are of them. And when we stand up and when we speak out, you know, there's nothing we can't accomplish. So, you know, if you're a fast food, retail, low-wage worker in general, and, you know, I'm, there's strikes going on in your area, I'm sure. There's organizing going on in your area. Just literally go to work and open your eyes, and I'm sure you will see someone trying to organize right next to you. Um, and then, Robert, uh, we have uh, one last question, and then I want to do a, a go-around of just closing, closing statements. Um, so... Uh, so what happened to part of the trade laws that address treatment of workers? Well, uh, well uh, some of our trade laws have uh, labor side agreements, and that we do, uh, uh, you know, they, they tend to be enforced, sometimes not well enforced. Uh, I think we ought to have trade agreements that require our trading partners uh, to uh, increase the wages of their workers as they as the nation becomes richer. For example, uh, suppose we had a rule in all of our trade agreements uh, that the minimum wage in nations that were party to those trade agreements had to be half uh, in that country. I mean, if we had that agreement, that would mean that our minimum wage would be much higher. Uh, but also other wages, uh, other minimum wages, even in poor countries, the minimum wages uh, would have to keep up with the overall growth of, uh, of other economies. That's good for us. It's good for them. Uh, that's the kind of rule that we ought to have in all of our trade agreements. Um, so I think that, oh, all right, I have one more question uh, for Robert, and then we'll do, uh, we'll do our closing statements. But... Uh, is it true that in, that entrepreneurs and investors are job creators? Should we keep giving them tax breaks or lose jobs? Uh, well, no. That's 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 a mythology that uh, the job creators are, you know, the, only the entrepreneurs or the 
or the big corporations or, or the wealthy. Uh, the real job creators are the middle class and everybody who aspires to join the middle class because they're the ones who buy the goods and services that, uh, that create jobs. Uh, you know, if uh, we have in our movie uh, an example of a very wealthy man, Nick Hanauer, uh, who runs a factory in uh, the state of Washington, a pillow factory, uh, and he says, look, I used to think of myself as the job creator. Uh, I used to subscribe to this old view uh, that I deserve tax breaks and I deserve uh, to make a huge amount of money because I'm, I'm at the top of the pyramid. Uh, but actually, he said, and he says in our movie, I've learned uh, the hard way that actually it's, it's a very broad and growing and prosperous middle class. They are the job creators because if they don't have the money, if they don't have the wherewithal, then I'm not going to make any sales. Uh, I'm not going to expand. I'm not going to hire anybody. Uh, business people have got to understand, if they don't already, uh, that the middle class and the poor, uh, they are the job creators. And that's why a more equal distribution uh, of income, a, a larger share of the gains of economic growth, uh, would be good for business. Uh, American, uh, you know, even, even people at the top, very wealthy people, would do better with a smaller share of a rapidly growing economy uh, because uh, prosperity is more widely shared than they are doing now with a very large share uh, of an economy that is uh, is barely growing at all, is very anemic and very fragile uh, because almost all the gains are going to a very small number of people at the top. Thank you. So that's it for our questions um, from folks watching. What I want to do is just um, quickly give each of our panelists an opportunity to um, share some closing remarks. Um, and if you could include in your closing remarks at least one way that people can, people all across the country can take action right now around income inequality. Um, and so why don't we start with um, Devante and Marielle. Well, we thought um, a way that a lot of people could get in to them with what we're doing is um, they can just, you know, people come in every day. Our consumer is the person that we satisfy every day. You know, we make sure that there is hot and fresh food for people every day. So the people that come in and get great service from us and see that we're in there working hard, making sure they get their food fast and timely and that it's fresh and that they're satisfied with the service that they get, just call and tell the company, like, look, these people deserve what they're asking for. You know, like, the more support, the better for anything, any cause. Uh, people just knocking on doors, going and just talking to people, getting petition signed, um, signing up with us. Just anything that you can do, talk to somebody, talk to your friends, talk to your, you know, coworkers, talk to your family, anybody. Just, if you believe in what we believe in, help us, help everybody else. You know, you can even call your elected officials, call, you know, your churches, call different community organizations, let them know what's going on. If you, you know, if you want to take that extra step and you don't know of any campaigns going on in your area, start one up yourself. Go start organizing, you know. It, it's for everyone. You know, if you're a low-wage worker, stand up and fight. If you're not a low-wage worker, stand up and support. You know, there's power in numbers. So just doing something as simple as going to your local McDonald's or, you know, your local clothing store and just saying, hey, you know, this is what's going on around the country. Maybe we should get something started here. You know, just as something as simple as opening your mouth and speaking can make all the difference. Thank you. Um, Jacob? Well, first of all, uh, I think that's a great answer, what they just gave, and I'm kind of inspired by what they're saying. So uh, good job, guys, and uh, and Thank you for doing what you do. Um, for, for, for me, um, uh, I think this issue of widening income inequality is the biggest issue of our times. That's why I made this film. That's why I'm so passionate about this issue, because I think it affects not only our economy. Our economy would doing, be doing better if we didn't have such a big imbalance in, in incomes in the way the income is distributed, but it also affects our democracy. I'm scared about what's happening to the country that I live in. I feel as though um, one of the big underlying factors to figuring out how to fix it, if you're a proud American, is to think and educate yourself about this issue in any way you can. Um, so uh, 
you know, first and foremost, you know, I if this hope, hopefully it's not too self-serving, but go see the movie. You know, watch it. Tell other people to go see it. Um, it's trying to do something about this issue and start a conversation about how to fix our economy in the midst of some real craziness going on in Washington. So what we need is a popular uprising of people kind of understanding that this issue is fundamental and it affects people no matter where you are in the income distribution and affecting their representatives in Washington. Um, Bob always says this, but nothing good happens in Washington unless good people outside Washington are organized, mobilized, and energized to do something about it. So that's what we hope will happen with this film. If you're looking for a specific action to take, I said it before, but I can say it again, um, you can do two things. You can go to www.inequalityforall.com and just click on how to take action. And there's a bunch of different ways you can get involved there. Or if you just have, if that's, if you just have your phone handy, you can text the word READY, R-E-A-D-Y, to 55155. And we'll give you an action to take just from there. So do one of those two things. Check out the movie and uh, and support support those guys who are on the panel with us. Awesome. And then Robert, you want to close us out? Uh, sure. Uh, let me just uh, say that I, I mean here we have, as part of this uh, particular discussion, uh, we've got two young men who are, are showing extraordinary courage. Uh, because they're standing up for what is right, they're standing up for uh, what people like them need, like low-wage workers, uh, the rights of, of low-wage workers to have a decent, minimally decent uh, wage and, and benefits, uh, and they're doing it with great courage. I think the least the rest of us can do is also stand up for what's right uh, and show courage and get involved in this fight. It's a struggle that's not going to be won immediately. No struggle that is worth the time is going to be won right away. But if you look back on the great struggle, struggles of, uh, of the last century, civil rights, uh, women's rights, uh, gay rights, uh, the struggle uh, to make sure that there was uh, a, a kind of a, a broad uh, gauge of, and a broad possibility of upward mobility for people. Uh, the movement uh, for free speech uh, that started even here at Berkeley almost 50 years ago. Uh, these movements, uh, these uh, fundamental changes in, in the social and power structure of society are not won uh, simply uh, by people casually writing petitions uh, or uh, joining uh, a, a website. They're won because people uh, devote time, uh, they strategize, uh, they organize, uh, they mobilize, uh, and uh, above all, they avoid cynicism. And let me finally say this, I think cynicism is one, one of the great plagues of our time, and it's one of the great obstacles to genuine social change. Uh, one of the reasons that Jake and I made this film is to give people a sense not only of what's happening and why it's happening, uh, because unless you know that, you don't even know where to begin uh, and what to understand what the solutions are. Uh, but also to give people a hope uh, and inspiration uh, that things will change, and they will change for the better if we all join together. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Move On. I want to thank all of you for arranging this and everybody who's tuned in. Uh, this is a big deal. Hope you see our film. Uh, more importantly, I hope you pitch in. Thank you, Robert, um, and thank you, everyone, for uh, for joining us tonight. Everyone out there, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and I just want to again thank our panelists, Marielle and Devante, um, Jacob and Robert, for joining us tonight and leading us in this um, really incredible conversation. And just want to leave uh, folks out there with uh, two websites where you can go to take action, or three websites where you can go to take action. One is lopeisnotok.org. The other one is inequalityforall.com. And the third one is moveon.org. Thank you, everybody, and have a great evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.